David Foster Wallace knew the minimalism that you are trying to write is not cute. Boy, you are not Ernest Hemingway. Boy, you are not Raymond Carver. And of course, on this channel, I advocate, support, and help creative geniuses grow. And there are exceptions out there. There are those people who are going to write beautiful minimalism like Raymond Carver or Cormac McCarthy. But we don't need any more Brett Easton Ellis minimalist interpreters, impersonators out there because... The pit of despair is already full, everyone. There is a line wrapping around the universe with terrible writers that need to go in there. And if you are enough of a savant to decide I'm going to become a minimalist, then there are better choices out there. So please, for the love of God, rethink your decision. And today, we are going to hear from David Foster Wallace on minimalism. And if you do not already know, I've been talking a lot to you today. This is the headquarters of David Foster Wallace content on YouTube. There is a playlist down below with a ton of David Foster Wallace content. And if you're seeing this past February 2024, there will be hundreds of videos in that playlist. And Wallace was absolutely shocked when he got to the University of Arizona in Tucson, where I am at right now. And let me tell you guys, the minimalist trend at the school has not really ended. And Wallace steps up to the plate at his writing workshops. As an author who actually had a book already published or like in the process of publishing, The Broom of the System, and he starts showing everyone his kind of metafiction and his budding maximalist prose, and they absolutely hated it. Every story in The Girl with the Curious Hair was absolutely shredded by the professors and by his peers. The only one they liked was his story on Lyndon B. Johnson because it had a lot of minimalistic tones and the story The Girl with the Curious Hair because that was an imitation and a mockery of Brett Easton Ellis's minimalism. But I think if we look back in, in retrospect, the universal spiritual woo reason, which I know none of you guys believe in, that Wallace was led toward the University of Arizona was that minimalism is one aspect of the dyadic side of writing styles. And on the other side, obviously, it's like metafiction. You could say maximalism's on the other side, but that's a little bit closer to the, minim uh, to the middle. M metafiction blows everything out of proportion and ruins the narrative just like minimalism does. And let's hear from Wallace about this. Quote, minimalism's just the other side of metafictional recursion. The basic problem's still the one of the mediating narrative consciousness. Both minimalism and metafiction try to resolve the problem in radical ways. Opposed, but both so extreme they end up empty. Recursive metafiction worships the narrative consciousness, makes it the subject of the text. Minimalism is even worse, emptier, because it's a fraud. It eschews not only the self-reference, but any narrative personality at all. It tries to pretend there is no narrative consciousness in its text. This is so fucking American, man. Either make something your god and cosmos and then worship it, or else kill it. And so if you guys haven't already heard or thought about this before, I'm sure a lot of you guys have, is that metafiction ruins stories because the authorial or nadir, narrator excuse me, narr narrative consciousness starts to interfere with the story and it ruins the entire experience. And this is why a lot of times when you look at a lot of metafictional pieces of art that work, they kind of break that fourth wall at the end. One of my favorites is obviously Alejandro Jodorowsky's The Holy Mountain. And at the end, there's this big metafictional reveal, but the narrative's over. They're they, you know, not to spoil anything, they complete the journey that they really want to go on, and then we get hit with it at the end. But if you don't do that, then you're going to have to convince us to stay for some reason. An author who does do this very well is obviously Italo Calvino, the famous Italian author. And in his very famous book, um, very influential book, actually, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, he starts off the book in the second person. He starts with second person, and, and he starts by saying, you are now reading Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler. And he kind of intersperses metafiction in, in the second person, and a bunch of other weird stuff throughout the novel. But he is a genius. He is a master writer, and he can kind of get away with that. And that's something that Wallace believes, and something I believe too, that if you want to be a minimalist or if you want to be a metafictionalist, then that's great. But you're going to have to be genre-breaking. You cannot be copying Italo Calvino or 
oh, Raymond Carver when it comes to minimalism or metafiction. You're going to have to branch out in, into something else because no one wants to be in a school of thought. No one wants to be labeled as, hey, you're punk rock or you're a postmodernist. A lot of artists reject labels. The only people who like labels are politicians. Yes, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. But as artists, we want people to feel. And so unless you are going to call me an inforealist, keep the labels off of me. And so as we're moving out of metafiction, I want you guys to remember that it fails because it places the mediating narrative consciousness on, on, at the top of the hierarchy as the most important thing in the story. And unless it's very interesting or done very well, then that's what's going to carry and kind of frame the entire work. So when we look at minimalism, the reason minimal, minimal, minimalism fails is the act exact opposite. It removes any narrative consciousness from the text. But as we know, there has to be a mediating voice. You cannot get rid of style and content on purpose to remove this narrative voice for this artistic purity, almost like the new critics when it comes to literary theory, thinking that you're going to trick the reader. It's in, That's why he calls it dishonest and a fraud. Because we all know that the story is being guided. I'm reading a book, goddammit, and my lower back hurts. And there's things going on around me. You don't have to trick me here. And what's important and what new criticism gets wrong is that who is guiding the text? It's all, you know, somewhat WWE, everybody. That I know when I'm going on a journey with Cormac McCarthy or you, or you guys are going on a journey with me, that there's a certain framing to this whole situation. Even if I'm talking about Thomas Aquinas in a very professional manner and very straightforward way and we're going super meta into his philosophy, you know I'm going to be taking shots at, Her at Aristotle, because we love our boy Heraclitus over here. And I would say the world would look a lot different if Aquinas found Heraclitus and took, his, and, and took his content and infused it into Christianity than him taking Aristotle. But we're talking about minimalism here. And this is one of the opportunities, we'll get back, and we'll get back to this minimalism in a second, that I see for authors today that we can develop a persona, and then when we give people our work, we can guide them through it. And some people may see that as a hack move. But whenever I start reading an author and I really like them, I go and read their Wikipedia. I go and see who they got divorced from, what their wife or their husband looks like, what their kids are up to. Maybe if I'm like really into them, I'm like, okay, I'm here. And honestly, the crazier it is, the better. That's the problem with Don DeLillo. He lives in Bronxville, about a half hour trains ride north of um, New York City. And He's been fairly reclusive. He married his wife in 1975. They have no kids, and we really never hear anything from him. There are no controversies. There is no story surrounding Don DeLillo, and I think that actually hurts him in terms of his canonical uh, status for the future. And I'd love to say it's all based on merit and what's in the text, but we still freak out over Shakespeare. Chaucer, at some level, in my humble opinion, is almost as good as Shakespeare, but we knew a lot about him. He was a an administrator, but Shakespeare has this kind of reclusive, not reclusive, but this kind of more ephemeral place in history. And so Wallace mentions America at the end because Americans love the extremes. That's kind of one of the main points of Infinite Jest, that we worship entertainment, that we can get, we get lost in entertainment. We exist on these extremes, and that's why we love minimalism so much. That when people become obsessed with something, a lot of the times they try to eliminate it. And what do we like with our characters? What do we like in story? Obviously, all the elements and good prose. But I want to feel empathetic. I want to be in, have emotion incited. We're looking for a captivating journey through the human experience or through landscape or through any of these things. And judging from how our consciousness is functioning in 2024, everyone. And unless you are off living in the woods, and this has to do with fiction, you guys, because I am a Chinese poet. That is my lineage. I, When I think of my writing and my future, I feel little to no ambition. And I enjoy removing the narrative voice and focusing on things and focusing on feelings when it comes to poetry. That's under 15 to 20 lines because I'm elevating something else. I'm engaging in a form of animism. But when it comes to my fiction... And what I'm working with in regards to that, I would be a fool to think I could apply all that I'm learning with that into fiction because the way my modern modern consciousness works, especially with long form content, and that involves humans in modern situations is spazzy. We are addicted to phones, to junk food, to um, everything involved with digital technology. We're driving on roads and going fast and um, engaging in fast paced dating and all these different elements of our society have been super, super 
sped into hyper reality. And when we look at what we should worship, because that's something that Wallace always talks about, that we just want something to worship, that we're looking to fill that slot in our brain that wants to be devoted. Well, an easy way to do that is a movement and a literary movement. And whatever it is at the time, and I would say right now, it really isn't minimalism. Right now, kind of the big trend out there is first-person POV uh, stories about dynamic, marginalized characters. And on the kind of deeper, more advanced side, what really has been working, I've noticed, in the publishing world is more psychological looks from multiple perspectives of institutions and things we hold very dear. One that came out in September that's been very popular that I enjoyed that people kind of say is in the same field as Wallace and Pynchon that I could agree, maybe not as good, is Wellness by Nathan Hill. And it's about marriage. It's like kind of like a Richard Yates revolutionary road, like expanded into, into something that's more post more postmodernist. And I know that book, which is a long book, it's almost 700 pages. Like I said, it, it has made millions. Well, I shouldn't say that. I know it's sold over 100,000 copies, so I don't know if that's a million dollars. But you are not Nathan Hill. You are not probably one of these people who has this marginalized voice that needs to get out and it's going to be digested by the DEI major publishing house units right now and all their editors. That's probably not you. And so it would take you years to be able to adapt to that. And by the time you do, the, the industry will have moved on. And so you can't be joining a movement. And if you're going to be worshiping something in your brain, if you're going to try and fill that slot and function in the American extremes, then for the love of God, worship sentence structure, worship syntax, worship you know, poetry or love or yoga or something at least that's going to elevate you and like keep you out of a lot of trouble. When I think of things that I want to worship and devote myself to, I try to, you know, find things that are non-hierarchical, things that I don't get sucked into. And that's why I think that worshiping authors, and you can worship authors too in general, and I think most of the time it works out well, especially if they're dead and aren't really connected to a movement, because the worst thing that happens if you start you know, getting really into David Foster Wallace, you might start wearing the white bandana and you know, being a little bit weird and going, you know, talking too much and going way too deep into stuff, and people are like, what the hell's going on? But there's no David Foster Wallace cult, you know? This is the closest thing to one, and we don't meet up in person. And at most, all I'm going to ask you is that if you want to write like David Foster Wallace, I have compiled a, over 100 of David Foster Wallace's favorite books and the three books that he writes with, that he wrote with, excuse me, every single time he was drafting, and also a ranking of all of his favorite books on writing. There's a ton of cool stuff in this ebook that I created just for you guys to be able to save time and get deeper into Wallace. And the link is down in the description below. That's my Wallace sales pitch. If I'm going to break the fourth metafictional wall here, I'm not hosting secret Wallace meetings over here in Tucson. I'm not taking up tennis because Wallace did. Anyway, you guys get the point. And the other thing that Americans love that we're all about is authenticity. You know, that weird dumb word. And that's like getting bigger and bigger. Like if you're trying to be authentic, then you're really being fake. If you have to worry about being authentic, then you, you just absolutely suck, let me just tell you. Anyway, but Americans love acting like they're feeling real. But that's the whole curse of minimalism. It's trying to present life as it is, as this real objective experience. And because we live in this wasteland of culture where nothing is real, where everything is created from dreams from scratch, like with Disney and all the other simulacras created by, like, by Hollywood and our politics and our, you know, mil the military industrial complex, with all of these different things, we've lost the ability to go on an actual meaningful search. And that's why we see Americans so depressed and having so many problems right now with mass shootings and all this other stuff. So one could say this is the entire Western world. I mean, obviously. And the other thing that obviously minimalism connects to is isolation. Another one of America's famous things. You stay off my land. This is private property, boy. I got to bring those boys back. But yes, that within us, there is a communal tissue there is this animistic ideal that we want to connect, not just with other humans, you guys. I know all you incels out there. Don't listen to that. But life before language was, and in oral culture, was one of ex the experience of sound and sight and the interpretation of that through in into revelation and all these other things. And then when the alphabet and the written word came, all that magic started to disappear. And that led to deep forms of isolation because we can share. When I'm reading David Foster Wallace, I hear David Foster Wallace. I can Bring David Foster Wallace back to the dead, back from the dead any time now and be with him. And then through letters, it leads us to not experience the phenomenological moment as much anymore and depend on isolation. And that's what minimalism is great at doing. There's no co-creative relationship. And if you guys don't believe me, go read David Foster Wallace's minimalistic piece 
the girl, a girl, the girl with the curious hair. It's a slog to get through. You know, there are obviously books, like I said, Raymond Carver, and they like they really captured this. But the best minimalists, like Cormac McCarthy and Carver, and even Hemingway, there's a soul embedded within there. They, there's the iceberg, not the windy goon iceberg, not the every single YouTube video iceberg, iceberg. You know, if I made a video, the David Foster Wallace iceberg, million views. Maybe I need to do that. What am I doing? But there has to, for minimalism to work, there has to be this massive psychic weight beneath. And if you're just doing it or have no ability or no skills, you're not going to be able to get that done. And so let me just say some kind words about minimalism really fast. I think that you need to engage in minimalism as a writer to understand that side of writing. That at times in paragraphs and in, in, in regards to creating beautiful contrast during individual sentences and paragraphs, you have to engage in minimalism. And contrast that with maximalism and a ton of other things. And having that ability is a skill in of itself. As I just talked about, there's this whole spectrum. And as a writer, it's almost like you are a golfer has to learn all these different shots. You have to know how to lob and chip and chip and putt and hit out of the bunker and drive and all these different things. And that's when we kind of look at the big maybe 10 schools of writing and styles, minimalism is obviously in there. And to become a master writer, you want to be able to work that in because I would say it's probably even in the top five of the most important things because when you kind of rope us in, rope someone into a story with some maximalist writing or some empathetic writing and you turn the minimal, you hit the minimalism button, it kind of can throw someone into a Zen experience. It can relax them because to transmute 2024 consciousness and stories and the evolution of style and how complicated it can get, it can be we're hitting the point where it can be tiresome. We can, we've only, we haven't evolved necessarily over the last 10,000 years. There's been epigenetic responses, but our brain can only handle so much information. You can only go so maximalist or esoteric or difficult before we just can't process it. If you've ever read scientific journals or um, literary journals, like sometimes you're just, your brain can't handle it. And the same can go with fiction. And so sometimes you need to turn down that volume to let people coast a little bit. I was actually reading Infinite Jest today, and Wallace does this a lot. Sometimes you'll have 25 pages on Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're reading it, and it actually requires some effort. But then you're reading about some random five-page monologue on the curriculum at the tennis academy, and you can kind of scan through it because you have no idea what the hell he's talking about, or a play-by-play -play of a tennis game. And that's honestly very maximalist, but even just some of the lighthearted stories or a conversation, you know, today I, there was this huge maximalist section talking about the woman with the veil. I can't remember her name right now. And right after that, Hal and Oren are having a conversation and it's just like a very dialogue heavy conversation for 20 pages. And that was after 50 pages of slog. So it's a good idea to build it up. And I would recommend Cormac McCarthy, Raymond Carver. And if you guys have any rec recommendations of your favorite minimalist, put them in, put them down in the comments below and help each other out. Thank you guys. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace.